first things first. How are we not supposed to mention I'm Jenna, Jenna Wolf, the first stop, words stop, stop, on television? Stop. That is the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. That is Nick Wright. You are my two favorite people at 6.30 in the morning on the planet right now. Can I tell you something? I feel how good. Much how much respect I have for you, Jenna Wolf. Jenna, we started this show the day after Labor Day. <laughs> Jenna's been sick. No. For 90% of the days, <laughs> she's true, only Nick. missed three Nick. shows due to it. You're once again battling through it. I am. I Jenna am. has the common cold, but it, it is what, what was it? Who had the leg injury? In <laughs> Sam Bradford. Remember the knee bruise that almost led to an amputation? Oh, yeah. Jenna Wolf has the only common cold. The, only from the it's knee. It's going to lead to a no. convalescent <laughs> home, but she's fighting through it every morning. So yeah. I appreciate Fight. it, Jenna Wolf. The thing what about it is the, 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 the center that she's going to, mm -hmm. their fitness program is going to get an upgrade. <laughs> It's all these late nights of basketball is what's doing it to me. Let's say that's why I'm yes, getting sick. Let's Absolutely. Because I, Good I'm for up you. very, very late watching the basketball. Uh, let us start with the Sixers and consider the process trusted, everyone. After four seasons marred with losses, and not the close ones, but the really ugly, lopsided losses. The 76ers have finally won their first playoff series since 2012. They beat the Heat in five games. Happened last night. Philly got double-doubles from both their young stars. You know the guys, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. They will now enjoy the moment and then await the winner of the Milwaukee-Boston series. All right, CeCe, let's start with you. How have the Sixers been able to overcome such a lack of experience? Because we said going in, the real knock on them was the fact that they had so much energy and, and they played so well and they're such a cohesive unit. Ah, but they have no playoff experience, so that was going to hold them back. It didn't look like they were holding them; they were being held back in any way. Well, playoff experience through the years has always been a benefit to teams that have it. So in Philadelphia, that's really all we can say about their team. So typically, they don't have a bench, either something about their coach, something about their star players, their role players. But they don't have those questions. So all you can really do is say, man, what are they going to do under the gun? But it's not a youth thing. We say the same thing about Houston. Man, what is Houston going to do? They got experience, but they don't have experience together. Or the experience that they have isn't good. It's bad experience. Right. Uh, the, the thing that, that I believe, there's a number of things. There's no one thing. Talent supersedes almost anything. They're a very, very talented team. Even on but, the biggest stages. Even on, But they're talented. I mean, they have maybe once every 20-type year player in Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. Like, when you have those types of players, it's going, to, it's going to trump some of the experience. But it's not just on them. Like, they're doing a great job playing their role. But, you know, after the trade, right before the trade deadline, they picked up two veteran players that really adds to what they're doing. J.J. Redick has a tremendous amount of experience in the role that he's playing. So they're very, very comfortable because they don't have to get outside of what they do. They're right. playing basically the same way they played during the regular se um, season. And Joel Embiid, he's been for out of college three years. Four. Four years. Four years. So ben Simmons has been out a couple years. So it's not like they were playing in the NCAA tournament last year sure. so they have been around the NBA I think that the other pieces their ability to get to the free throw line in the playoffs like a veteran team that's how they're able to overcome experience besides man this is a good basketball team they're a good defensive team they're a good shooting team and they're really talented and well coached I'm gonna to answer your question say three things they have that has trumped the lack of experience in no particular order of importance one excellent coaching Brett Brown saw this through the fire. The team allowed him to see this through the fire, so he has the respect of his players, and he has proven to be a very sharp head coach. Point two, team building as a whole. Adding Ursan Ilyasova and Marco Bellinelli, as yes. CC alluded to. Realizing, you know what, instead of overpaying on a multi-year contract for a B-plus player, why don't we way overpay on a one-year contract for a B-level player who fits us perfectly in J.J. Redick. Things like that to where they are. We talk about the Rockets. They have a similar analytical approach to what are good shots, what are bad shots, and the players we acquire are going to focus on the good shots rather than the bad shots. Robert Covington, another example, one of the hidden gems of the process. And point three is this. They got swagger, man. 
And I, it matters in the – when we talk about playoff experience, one of the things reasons that matters is you have to have the confidence that the moment is not too big for you. And Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons carry themselves with this swagger of, I am the best player not only in this game, but in every game I play in. You cannot stop me. Some of that swagger just comes from physical size, that in every game Joel Embiid's played in, essentially, since he's 16 years or older, he's been the most physically imposing guy. And by the way, Ben Simmons... Same thing with him as far as guys in his position. So they carry themselves with almost a tough guy bravado that has proven out to work thus far in the playoffs. Like, they they have a punch-you-in-the-face defense. They play at a frenetic pace. And this year, if they don't turn the ball over, when they turn the ball over a bunch, they're a 500 team. When they turn the ball over just less than 17 times. So they can still have four turnovers a quarter. They're 35-9. and nine. If they take care of the basketball because they take such high efficiency these shots because they have so much talent and because they're so well coached they're as good as anybody in the league this is a team that lost one game in the last six weeks one game they had that phenomenal stretch coming down mm -hmm. and then to start the postseason like this but let's just break that down a little bit we talked about how special of a player Ben Simmons is in what theoretically is his, his first full year playing basketball mm -hmm. what kind of statement did he make both to that team and then to, to you know I guess whoever's gonna be waiting them in the next yeah, round. I think he makes a statement by playing within himself not trying to shoot. Um, I've criticized his inability to be able to shoot beyond, say, seven feet. But he's played his game. You know, he's been a floor general. He's played good defense. He's a, he's a young kid of a few words. Doesn't play with, uh, with, with, with the type of emotion that could you see him go up and down like younger players do. He plays with a swagger, with the confidence that Nick talked about. But it's a quiet confidence that we typically don't see. Typically, when guys have confidence, you see them talking to let you know that they have confidence. Very seldom do you see Ben is a lot like LeBron. You won't see him saying a whole bunch of things, but he has that quiet confidence that other guys have been able to feed off. So this inexperience, when you are a once every couple decade type player, like your life, Ben Simmons, he thinks one day he's going to be the best player in the world. So this is just part of the process being in the playoffs. I like the fact that they don't think that the process is 2019 or 2020. They're in it. They think that the process is right now, and they're good enough to win right now. And Joel Embiid is even taking on himself. Draymond Green and him have struck up a relationship where him and Draymond are texting during the playoffs, and Draymond has been trying to tell him some things to be able to help make that learning curve not so steep for him. It's about what to do in the playoffs after the first couple games. Joel Embiid was a little overwhelmed by the crowd and, and how they embraced this team and the overall noise in the first two games in Philadelphia. So they're doing a number of things that would – get them to the position where they would be comfortable in that spotlight. And thank goodness Joel Embiid's not a pending free agent because the last pending free agent Draymond was texting her in the playoffs then signed <laughs> with the Warriors. So we don't have to worry about that. But the, the, the confidence that winning this series the way they did in pretty dominant fashion. I said yesterday or day before, the playoffs are supposed to be hard. These games were hard for Philly through the first half very often through three quarters, and that had been their biggest weakness all year if you watched this team all year. They were not a great second-half team, and they were a bad offensive fourth-quarter team. In these playoffs, they've been extraordinary in the second half, particularly in fourth quarters. I don't want to overstate what they did because Miami was a great matchup for them. Miami does not have a single offensive player that really scares you, and we know how good Philly's defense is. And in the next round, they're either going to face a team in Boston that I think has the coaching edge or a team in, in, in Milwaukee that will have the best player in the series. But Philly should be a favorite no matter who comes out of that Boston-Milwaukee Yeah, I series. think being the best player in the series is an overrated thing, especially when you look at the collection of talent around someone like Philadelphia. I'd much rather have what they have in Philadelphia. They can have Giannis. Well, particularly and because the gap between Giannis and I, I the best player now in Philly is now with the three-point line, the guy who's the best player becomes less relevant because so many other role players can contribute to the to the to the process. All right, again, Philly now waits to see the winner of the Celtics Bucks series. Chris Broussard is going to be with us a little later break down that game as well as everything else last night. Coming up, we'll talk a little football. Gronk is officially returning, said so himself. Should we pencil in another Super Bowl for the Patriots or maybe Penn? That's next, first thing first. 
This is Nick Wright, and I wanted to tell you that this episode of the First Things First podcast is brought to you by Buffalo Wild Wings. There's a new boss in town at Buffalo Wild Wings, and he deals in bacon. It's the Bacon Boss Burger, featuring bacon three different ways and a blanket. I said a blanket of white cheese sauce. And he's joined by other new favorites like the smothered cheese steak quesadilla, sweet chili shrimp, and Alaskan Cod Classic. All pair perfectly with a Sam 76 of fruity ale with the crisp finish of a lager. Hurry in today. Try them all before they're gone at Buffalo Wild Wings. Wings, beer, sports, available for only a limited time while supplies last. And please, of course, drink responsibly. Now, back to the show. First Spurs and Warriors, Draymond Green to Andre Iguodala in transition for the alley-oop. Nice pass. Iggy's still getting it done in year 14, Nick. Man, I will give Iggy credit. He looks a little more spry in this first round of the playoffs than he did most of the regular season. He maybe paced himself well this year. Yes, it's not hard to look athletic against the Spurs. So. <laughs> this is the least athletic Spurs team I've ever seen. They when you're jumping well next to Manu. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on to Bucks and Celtics, Marcus Smart to Al Horford for the full extension, full extension dunk. Horford finished with a team high 22. CC Horford was excellent last night, but getting Marcus Smart back is big for them. They yeah. thought he was done for the year, most likely. Getting him back is important for them. Yeah, as the coach said, Stevens, he, he's like, listen, you can't look at the stat sheet to evaluate how important he is to the team. His energy plays, his hustle plays, yes. He's he's like a Danny Ainge type player. Oh. But Danny Ainge could shoot, though. Thank you. Of course he could. He was amazing. Um, it was a role player. <laughs> and finally, he started. Finally, Heat at 76ers. Ben Simmons threading the needle to Robert Covington. Philly moving on to the second round. Ben Simmons, if he had got, had five more assists in this game, I thought he was going to end up doing it. He would have averaged a triple-double for the series, just become the second rookie ever to average a triple-double in a playoff series behind Magic Johnson. But, I mean, he didn't need to last night. They were in full control most of this game. They do a great job of taking advantage of his ability, his height, where the passing lanes, and they have so many shooters that you have to spread the court. That, now, he's an excellent passer. You don't see that skill on young players. No. Moving on, new topic now. It looks like the Patriots are slowly falling back into place. Yesterday, Tom Brady's agent announced he'll be playing in 2018. And then we found out that Rob Gronkowski is following suit. Gronk confirmed this on Instagram. He said on his page, I met with Coach today and informed him I will be back for the 2018 season with the Pats. I've been working out, staying in shape, and feel great. Looking forward to another championship run. Then followed by a hashtag, which I'm told is a lyric from the rapper Juicy J and not an ode to resistance bands. (laughs) Um, Bands make them dance something. Anyway, CC, that's not important now. Uh, how important is it for the Patriots to get Gronk back? Jenna, on your script, I'm just going to tell you, tell check, me. check yourself Jeff. before you wreck yourself. Fans, okay. resistance. Uh, so it's probably you know, it's some kind of workout reference, you guys. So Clearly, that's what he was talking about. Okay. Um, I, I'm not surprised that, that Gronk is coming back to play 2018. Um, I thought some things were very, very telling as far as a meeting with Bill Belichick. He also brought his agent to the meeting in Drew Rosenhaus. Um, the meeting last week with Des Bryant, remember Des Bryant, his agent wasn't invited, and Jerry Jones came by himself. You know, yeah, so you said I knew there was going to be a problem. Now, if Bill Belichick and you have agreed that your agent is going to be a part of it, it's not only talking about football, it's talking about some non-football related things. That would be... Gronk wants to get the assurance that he, that he won't be traded this year. And that's why part of his announcement, I'll be back. The reason why you have Drew Rosenhaus there, because the Patriots weren't going to give him more money, because they would have announced that. All right, You have him there because we have a verbal agreement that he won't be traded. Now, and I also believe it was on the table for Gronk to walk away from the game. For it to be the end of April and for him to have a face-to-face with Belichick, that means it must have been real. And he must have had a conversation after the season. I don't know what I'm going to do. So it's nice for New England to have Gronk back. Without them having a left tackle, Gronk is the most important part of that offense besides Tom Brady. They don't have an elite receiver. Edelman, I believe he'll be back and be effective. But typically, with an ACL injury, you're going to take about a year, a year and a half. He's not a spring chicken. He's not a young guy. So I expect him to be effective, but how explosive will he be? I think he'll be a good NFL receiver. So we need Gronk 
to be in the middle of that offense. And as a run blocker, Gronk is second to none. So if you're going to have a rookie left tackle, which they're probably going to have, they're going to be a left-handed team more. I mean, they're going to put Gronk on the left side. They're going to run more left to be able to help out that guy. And <coughs> Gronk will stay in and be able to pass protect more. So those are the things in the effect that I see with Gronk announcing that he's coming back in 2018. And on the football field, I know that the numbers are the Patriots went about as much with Gronk and without Gronk. And you say, I, you know, everybody's replaceable. Where he's not replaceable, in addition to the places CeCe mentioned, is in the red zone. Since Gronk came into the league in 2010, who leads the NFL in red zone yards? Gronk. Catches. Gronk. Touchdowns, Gronk. He has been the best red zone threat for nearly a decade in this league by a wide margin, by every possible metric. So they obviously need him from a football perspective. But the other thing that was interesting about this was the timing to me, was with the draft coming up tomorrow and with what Gronk did this weekend. That press conference at Monster Motocross where he's dressed up like a dirt bike racer and then everyone's peppering him with questions about, are you playing next year? What's your plan for next year? And he was demurring on them saying, I'm here to talk about motocross. I'm just here to talk about today. And when Belichick has this meeting, I, I believe what at least what makes the most sense to me was Belichick wanted this confirmation and the only way Gronk was going to get the confirmation that we're not trading you is if Belichick got the public confirmation that Rob Gronkowski is playing next year. For what reason? That, so all that stuff goes away? Well, it's not only so it all goes away, but so they also know what their best method in this draft is. Like, you have the Yeah, I don't think the public thing, I don't think Belichick's ended. I think that's, based on their conversation, Gronk could decide whatever he wants to do. That He did that for his brand. Oh, sh sure. I wasn't saying the public, though. I think the con – do you think prior to this meeting, Belichick knew Gronk was coming back next year? I don't. I think you just – you said – I, I, I don't like to make those kind of guesses. Okay. I well, don't. I think that I, – I don't, I don't like to make those kind of guesses. The, the, the point that I'm making is that I think Belichick needed to know from Rob Gronkowski whether he needed it to be public or not – are you back next year? Do you know if you're back next year? Because we have this draft coming up, and I need this information. And so if the that's typically in NFL, as far as players, they have until free agency. That's one window and the draft. That's sure. another window when you're talking about are they going to move on from a player? Is a player going to retire so that the team can be able to make the right adjustment to that decision? And the other, the other thing this signified to me was – CeCe, you talk about all the time about how we, we need to recognize who is in charge of the New England Patriots. That aside from Tom Brady, who might be have superseded the chain of command somewhat, no other player has, even a player as good as Rob Gronkowski, even a player as talented and as valuable as Rob Gronkowski. And w what Belichick, in my eyes, is, I, I don't think he's doing this intentionally, but it did remind me, is that, listen, th there are no sacred cows here. I need to know if you're playing or not. You tell me that. I'll let you know, as CeCe mentioned. We're not going to trade you at the draft. But if you're still hemming and hawing, if you're still questioning it when this draft starts on Thursday, well, what you've done for us is great, but that does not guarantee you a job here in 2018. That does not guarantee you your place in this franchise moving forward, no matter how accomplished of a player you are. Were Gronk's only options, realistically, retiring or coming back and play for the Patriots? Like, did money factor into this at all? Was any part of this leverage to, at some point, in some capacity, either get traded to make more money or somehow make himself invaluable to this Patriots team so that he could get paid more money? No, I don't think so. I don't think money had anything to do as far as New England. Like, could he force them into giving him a new contract? No. I don't, I don't know personally if he wanted to play somewhere else and then trying to play somewhere else that he would get another contract there. I don't know those things, but I just know that no one's going to strong-arm Bill Belichick. No one's going to strong-arm Kraft. I keep telling you guys this. There's one sheriff in New England, and that's Bill Belichick. And if you want to play football there, you're going to play his way. That's the reason why the organization has been so successful. That's the reason why they've participated in so many Super Bowls, and that's why they have won the Lombardi Trophy the number of times that they have. Let me just ask you one follow-up question. What was? Do you think the timing of this meeting, the impetus of it was the draft is this week? And yes, we, of course. And that we need to know what your yes. – and had Gronk said if, – if Gronk doesn't come to them about any money, not about a new contract, guys, I just don't know what I want to do. How do, – that affects their plans tomorrow considerably, correct? 
in your yes. eyes? That, and so, I mean, if you're losing an all-pro tight end and you've already lost your left tackle, you've already lost one of your right receivers, of course it does. Right. And so I don't know if Gronk wanted to make the commitment at, in the time frame he did, but to the sheriff point, like, the team said, in or out, like, we need to know right now, and Gronk did what I think most of us thought he was going to, which is play and, football next year. And in two days, the Patriots got their quarterback and their tight end to confirm, for the most part, that they are coming back for this coming season. All right, coming up, back to basketball. How much trouble could the Warriors be in without Steph in round two? First things first, back after this. The FIFA World Cup starts on June 14th, then Fox and FS1. It was like yesterday was 100 days to the world. It seemed so far out, and now it's right here. Man, my only critique on the World Cup is I wish it was every three years. I wish it was more often. I'm so – it, it is – A close this, second critique would be that, that the U.S. was in it. Yeah, of course, that sure, but I'm so excited for this, man. This is going to be awesome. What team are you picking to sponsor or put your – I told you I'm Team Mexico this year. Team Mexico. I would have gone with Italy – but Italy's not in it, so I'm Team Mexico. Great Britain. Yeah. Great Britain. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great Britain. But I've been Steph watching a lot of Great narcos, Britain. man. I might go with the Columbus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thomas Rodriguez. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. Let's yes. do Thomas Rodriguez. Yeah. England. Yeah. What, England? England? Yeah, England's a good pick. Yeah. Good England's pick. a good pick. Good Solid soccer pick. tradition there. Solid pick. I'm excited for this. Let's go. 50 days away, seven weeks and one day. Right Starts here on Fox. Seven Time weeks from for tomorrow. some stories to start your morning. You're going with the Brits for Steph? Yeah. Okay, all right, I got it. Yeah. Check yourself. Yesterday, Cowboys owner Jerry Jones came out and said that there's no chance Dez will come back to the team. And that, quote, we know we won't get a pure X receiver to take the place of Dez in the draft. CC, how will Dallas be able to fill the void left by Dez's release? They're going to have to do it by committee. Typically, when a team loses a big-time running back, they're like, listen, we're going to have three guys fulfill that role. I look at a couple guys, Alan Hearn being the number one guy to be able to take some of those receptions. Take it away. But also, I see him throw into the running back. Get Ezekiel Elliott involved in the passing game more. That's how they will take – that's how they will get those 800 yards that Des Bryant was getting. Well, and you got to think about it I, – or I have to think about it as, like this as well. You're not going to replace him with a player that can make some of the spectacular plays Des can. But can you replace him with players that can do some of the small things better? Des was near the bottom of the league in yards after catch. He was near the bottom of the league and bottom four in the league as far as catch percentage. So maybe a guy that – or guy Guys that catch a higher percentage of balls thrown to them, guys that get you a few more yards after the catch, that's a way to get to the 800 yards, even if you're not going to have some of these highlight catches that we're showing. All right, on to the NBA now. Last night, the Sixers were able to knock off the heat and advance to the second round of the playoffs. Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid played up to their usual standards. Also, J.J. Redick added 27 points. Nick, what impressed you the most about the Sixers in this round? Their finishing kick. Man, in games one, three, and four, it was the fourth quarter. In game five, it was the third quarter. But these were closely contested games, almost all of them, through halftime. And then most of them through three quarters. And then the Sixers just annihilated folks. Like, they, they carried themselves with the confidence. The opposite of how the Cavs have played this postseason, to be totally honest, where they're trying to hold on for dear life at the end. They're spreading you out at the end of games. I'm really impressed how efficient they can be. Game number four, you talked about the turnovers. They had 27 turnovers. Still get a win for a young team to be able to do that. And then the respect the referees gave them. Joel Embiid shooting more free throws than anyone in the playoffs. KD, LeBron, all these mm -hmm. veteran players. That right there is a respect factor that I believe will pay dividends as they move on. All right, on to the other side. Dwayne Wade played 30 minutes and scored 11 points in what may be his final NBA game. After the game last night, Wade said he hasn't made a decision on retirement just yet. Cece, how tough of a decision is Wade facing right now? It's always tough when you're trying to transition from something that you've grown up dreaming about doing to what do I do next. Dwayne Wade's had a spectacular career, but whatever he decides to do next, and I'd like to see him, like Alonzo Mourning and other greats with the Heat, work for the organization. Mickey Erickson, the owner there, Pat Riley have done a great job of keeping guys that have been the face of that franchise part of that franchise in South Florida. What he's done for the, also for the community in South Florida, schools and for young people. Dwayne Wade is, it's Wade County Wade in County. the 305. So, man, they should keep him involved in it. I don't think he should play any more basketball. Those three championships speak for themselves. If he does walk away, this is where he is. 
As far as thresholds of points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks. I know you got a list. Go how, ahead. No, this is this this one will jar you. Players that have as many points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, all-star games and championships as D Wade. Two. Here's the full list: Jordan and LeBron. Yes. That that I knew you had a list. That, that, that's where he's at. <laughs> So he's one of the four best in the history of his position as far as career accomplishments and those titles and those all-star games and being a great player starting midway through year one. Like, D. Wade's a Pantheon guy already. I'm not kicking him out of the league, but it would have been – he had a couple nice playoff moments. Would have been ni- – this would be a nice ending for yeah, him. Yeah, his, his wife tweeted last night she didn't know what he was going to do, but he was cute. So, <laughs> so Dwayne Wade, so moving that. forward, I think he's going to be all right. <laughs> Last night, Marcus Smart returned to the lineup for the first time since March 11th, gave the Celtics a much-needed boost to win Game 5 against the Bucks. Get this, when the series is tied 2-2, teams that win Game 5s in best of seven series go on to win 83% of the time. Nick, what was your biggest takeaway from last night's game besides my stat? Well, well that the Celtics won <laughs> uh, despite Jason Tatum, their most talented player, having his worst game of the playoffs, only making two field goals. Al Horford was excellent for them. They, I thought they missed an opportunity at the end of the first half. What could have been a 17-18 point lead ended up only being an 11-point lead. And I thought Milwaukee would have a kick at some point. And they did. But the, they never got it closer than four. They shut down Giannis in a way that the Bucs are going to have to ask Giannis and their coaching staff some questions. And you mentioned it. It's 83% if you win game five. If, you're the ho- if you have home court advantage and you win game five, I think it jumps to 93%. Like, they are now in the driver's seat firmly in this series. That obviously wouldn't be the case if they were down 3-2 going back to Milwaukee. My biggest takeaway is Giannis could have stayed in Milwaukee. I mean, for what he did. I, I, I can't say they shut him down. When you only take 10 shots, you have no offensive rebounds. Like, I don't know where he was. Like, he was not a participant in the game. When I saw the game, this was a game the Celtics were not playing well. They did play with a lot of energy. Marcus Smart did give them some type of boost, the intangibles, the toughness that he brings to them. But Giannis, to me, was the biggest takeaway from the game. As a superstar in this league, that is not the overall energy that I would like to see him play. At no point did he try to take the game over. At no point did he put his thumbprint on the game. So in in watching the game, that that to me, um, that was a little on the criminal side because I thought for a fact that Giannis, after what he did in game three and game four, and the type of energy that he gives this team. And part of that's on Giannis, but we also, we do try on this show to give good coaches and good coaching jobs credit. Part of that's on the Bucks coaching staff as a whole, because it was obvious at halftime that Giannis was either not fully engaged, I don't, that's too harsh of a criticism, that he was not getting the ball in his spot enough, that he was not being aggressive enough. And they needed to either adjust something, adjust something with him, or adjust something with the point guard play to get him the ball more. What can't happen is this, that Giannis in 41 minutes takes 10 shots, and Shabazz Muhammad coming off the bench in nine minutes takes nine shots. Like, that is not a recipe for winning. And despite that, and here's the other reason it was so disappointing from a Giannis perspective, despite that, like I said, they got it down to four midway through the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. That's when you could have just run everything through Giannis. That's when Giannis who could have attempted to take over the game. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, CC. You'd be more okay with Giannis being 5 for 19. Like take being 5 shots. for 10. At least like, be involved more. If he just has an off night, that's one thing. I'm into winning. When your best player plays better, you have a better chance to win. It's also a mentality. These are role players on, like, Role players, Barkley says it, role players, they play better at home. They play worse on the road. This is involved. Man, you've got to take advantage of this opportunity. Get, getting the series back after being down 0-2, tying it up. I mean, this is a, a best of three series. If you are a superstar, one day you're saying he's going to be the best player in the league. He didn't look like that to me. When you only get 10 shots in a free-flowing game the way they were playing, that's not the coaching staff's fault. That's just Giannis's fault. Okay, the, the, uh, agreed. And Well, it's at least partially on Giannis in this game. I well, I don't know what sets they were running. So he's the only one I can blame. The, but I've watched it, any of the superstars that don't get their shots. It's not because the coach didn't call enough plays for them. Well, the, they they don't run plays every time down the court. 
I think it's a, you have to do slightly different math when the superstar we're talking about is 23 years old. I think more of an onus goes on the coach if we're talking about a young superstar in the biggest game of his career up to this point than if we're talking about KD or Harden or LeBron, guys that have the experience and the, I would say, the cachet to dictate what the team is running. Like, I, I thought Milwaukee's been one of, if not the most poorly coached team all year, whether it was Jason Kidd or Joe Prunty. I'm not removing any agency from from Giannis. He, as good as I believe he is, one of the top eight players in basketball, he needed to be better, but he could have gotten more help from the guys wearing suits on the sideline as well last night. All right, let's move on to the Warriors. They needed every minute of the game last night against the Spurs to close out the series in advance, completing the gentleman sweep, my favorite expression in sports, <laughs> by the way. They beat the Spurs 99-91. Warriors did it without Steph Curry, who will miss at least part of the next round with that knee sprain. Speaking of the next round, Warriors will face one of the hottest teams in the West in the Pelicans in round two beginning on Saturday. Nick, how much of a challenge do the Warriors face now without Steph? They're thinking maybe two games, maybe longer. No one's really said for sure. We don't know yet. All right, so they're facing the team that feels the best of the way they're playing of any team in the playoffs. I'd say Philly maybe is a close second. The, the Pelicans right now are feeling better about how they're playing basketball than they felt as an organization maybe ever and of anyone in the playoffs. And they happen to be playing better they're, basketball. They're, they're playing than great. Played, but yes. so it, it, if they're going to give the Warriors trouble, here's what they have to do. They have to avoid foul trouble more than any other team in the playoffs. They've got four reliable players. Anthony Davis, Holiday, Rondo, Miritich. They, this is a team, some teams go eight deep, some teams go nine deep. Right now the Pelicans go four and a possible deep. So they have to avoid foul trouble. Anthony Davis has to, if they're going to give the Warriors trouble, midway through this series, the discussion that shows like this have to be having are, is Anthony Davis the best player in the league? Is that where he is? He has to be that level of good each and every night, and they have to hope that Draymond and Iggy stay cold from the perimeter, Draymond in particular. I would say those are their three biggest keys to stealing one of these first few games without Steph, and that's the only way they can win this series is if they steal home court from Golden State in those first two games. I'm looking forward to this series. They present a number of problems. It all starts with the brow, not just because he's a good player. It's because <laughs> the lack of a center for Golden State. Like, if you look at the work that Aldridge was able to do against Golden State, if you look at the way San Antonio was able to hang in there as far as rebounding, like, man, the Pelicans are so much better. They're so much more athletic. I like the point you talked about as far as foul trouble because they're not that deep. And especially the Brow can't get in foul trouble, nor can Drew Holiday get in foul trouble because he has one of the tougher two-way assignments in dealing with Clay Thompson. So I'm looking forward to this series because I believe this is a series also that the Brow, he can get the type of people looking at his game like never before. We always thought about his potential. Potentially, he could be one of the best players. He is the best center in the NBA now. And without Golden State having the center, if he has one of those types of series. Now, he's just coming off of 33 Monster. and 12. He needs to play at least that good and probably still need to score more points than that for, gold, for them to have a chance against Golden State. So let's talk about Golden State for a second. Yeah, they got out of this series with the Spurs. Spurs played them hard, and Spurs were missing Kawhi, obviously. They were tested, and yes, they won. But what kind of wake-up call do you think this was for Golden State? Because I don't know if it's going to be, uh, I mean, a similar type of play that they're going to find in the Pelicans well, after this. Well, it's odd because the Warriors have the best point differential in the playoffs of any team, but it doesn't feel that way. They are winning these. They've won their games, including the game they lost. They've outscored their opponent by more than anyone else, more than the Pelicans in their sweep. And that feels almost impossible if you watched these games. It's because the Warriors were able to play lackadaisical for a quarter or a half, and then just blitz you with talent, even without Steph, because the Spurs were so shorthanded. They're not going to be able to do that against the Pelicans. But the matchup you touched on, CC, that is the key to the early part of this series. Drew Holiday, Clay Thompson. Drew Holiday is coming off what was the, obviously the best playoff series of his career, but also one of the toughest asks. We need you to be our second best point scorer, and we need you to be our best perimeter defender. Well, the ask just got 
lot tougher with all the screens they're going to run Clay Thompson off of, with the size Clay Thompson has. He has a size advantage over Drew Holiday as opposed to a disadvantage size-wise the way Lillard or McCollum did. That's the matchup outside of Anthony Davis versus whomever to watch the most in this series. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what it's going to come down to. But I, I, So you're not concerned at all? What do you mean? I mean, I, I don't know. I just felt like watching that game. It just felt like it wasn't. A, we always talk about it, is that the Warriors cakewalk. They just cakewalk through the playoffs. I mean, the it Warriors didn't seem like they aren't as good without Steph. But the Warriors right? aren't going to have Steph at least for a couple games. Okay, but they played the worst team in the playoffs in the Spurs. So it's hard to be able to analyze something off of the Spurs team was not athletic. They didn't put any pressure on them. They gutted out on emotion game number four to win to even take it to, to five games. Like this was they were never a threat to Golden State. So the to your question about whether or not like so what where it is hard to evaluate who the Warriors are based on who they just played. The I still think even without Steph, the Pelicans have to play at their A level game to beat Golden State. And if Steph comes back, they have to hope he's not at 100%. Unless Anthony Davis, like CeCe mentioned, he went 33-12. and 12. I don't think that's enough in this series. I think he somehow has to take his game to an even higher level. Like, we are, we have not yet seen the Warriors at full go as of yet in these playoffs because they haven't had to be. So that's why, even though they might, maybe didn't look wildly impressive in round one, I don't think anyone's too worried about them, even though they're playing a very good Pelicans team in round two. All right, we'll see you on Saturday for game one. Coming up, how will Josh Rosen handle an NFL locker room? Talk about that next on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First. We're now joined by former NFL head coach Eric Mangini. It's been What's too up, long. Coach? Good to see you, Coach. How are been. you? You getting What's excited? That handshake. Yeah. But yeah, I'm sure you do. Every day, you just shake your hand. Absolutely. You, you miss? Are you excited for the draft? Do you uh, get excited? Do you like? Is it? Do you get nervous? Do you get anxious? Do you remember being in the war room? Do I get nervous or anxious now? No, you know I'm what? not That's nervous just... at all, or anxious, <laughs> or any of those things. Nice and relieved. Yeah, and even even on uh, draft day, especially in the first round, you've done so much work. You've done. You've you've discussed the players over and over again. You've gone through every situation. If you if you've done it. that right, then you should be you should be fine. Just follow the board. All right. I'm going to follow this board because, <laughs> because that's what they're telling me. 36 hours to go until the NFL draft on Fox. Big draft party at Mangini's hotel room tomorrow night. Huge. I will post the address and what you can bring later on Twitter. Uh, let's talk about Josh Rosen, though, the outspoken former UCLA quarterback facing as many questions off the field as on it. Too smart, too curious, too millennial. He joined the herd yesterday via Skype. Take a listen to this. I'm a very opinionated guy. But I like running into people with other opinions because I want to. I want to refine my opinions. I want to run. I want to come into a coach, and I want. I want him to ask me how I've how I used to do it in the past, so that we can basically get after it and see and get something good out of it. I. I don't want like you don't want yes men all over the place because, um, that's just that's just not how successful people function. Um. I want to inspire kids to be good. I want to inspire kids to do good things and think for themselves. I'm going to sit down with my coach, and I expect him to bring it every single day just like I will. Like I, I, don't, I don't want my coach slacking because I want him pushing to me to be the best that I possibly can be. I don't, I don't not, I'm not clocking in. I'm not clocking in, clocking out, and collecting a paycheck. I want to come in, and I want to be challenged every single day and make sure that my coach is on it and cares about this thing, and cares about football, and becoming the best possibly can be as much as I do. And that's where sometimes people talk about me rubbing the wrong way with coaches and stuff. It's, it's, it's because I really care about this thing. I want to be the greatest of all time, the greatest of all time. And if my coach isn't on the same page as me, we might have issues. I, I, like, I want to be the best. And you, I want you to want me to be the best as well. Coach, there was a lot said there, um, and a bunch of takeaways, I'm sure. If, if you were coaching and, and Josh Rosen came up to you and wanted to argue with you and find out if you wanted to be there as much as he wanted to be there, I mean, all these different questions he asked, how would you feel about coaching a kid like this coming out of school? Well, I went through a range of emotions as I, as I watched that, that clip, and I think if he had just stopped talking a little bit earlier in the clip, it would have been, it would have been really good. I, I appreciate a guy who is going to ask questions. I, I think that players have the right to ask questions. And I think as a coach or a teacher, you should be able to explain the why. And when players understand the why, they do a much better job of solving problems when it doesn't look like what you, you had projected it to look like. So I, I'm okay with that. I didn't love the, 
you know, I want, I want, I want. Ideally, the I want part you could you could mute a little bit in in that uh, in that part of it. Uh, I I think the too smart knock on on a kid like that that to me that's a high class problem, especially at quarterback. I've dealt with a lot of guys that weren't smart enough, and that's a really difficult problem to overcome. Do I think that that there's going to have to be uh, a learning curve with both the coach and player and team with a guy like Josh, who uh, obviously has a lot of questions? Yeah, but there's a lot of problems that you have to overcome with any draft pick that you bring in. The li- Josh clearly means well, and he I I buy into the fact that he wants to be the best ever. I don't look at that that differently than Tom Brady walking up to Robert Kraft shortly after he was drafted and said, this was the best decision you've ever made. And then proving out, by the way, to make that true. I I do think he, at times, like you said, t- maybe talks a li- keeps going a little bit longer and can stumble himself. Just make himself. it simple. He talks too much. Go ahead. He keeps No, I was just one. you were trying to put some fancy smart thing on it. He talks too much. Like... It's just as simple as that. Well, what I and he alluded to this, or he said this in the interview with Colin. We we do sometimes put these guys in a bit of a jackpot, which is we ask them like he's doing a round of interviews because people want to talk to him. We want these guys to be honest, and then when they talk to us and they're honest, that we we criticize guys for that, and we criticize guys for not saying anything at all. Like it's a fine line. He obviously errs on the side of probably sharing more than he should. None of it to me seems malicious, though. None of it to me seems overly problematic as long as what he's saying is genuine as long as he does as long as he's putting in the work ethic in order to give himself the best chance to be the best ever as long as he is open to as when he's the coach says how did you used to do it as long as his ears and eyes are also open to but how do you want to do it how are we going to do it like I think it can be beneficial in the long run to have that type of mind for this but I understand why going into it some people might be like man it does seem like a bit of a headache because dealing with curious smart people can be a pain like I understand but it also can be to me exceptionally rewarding Uh, there is no football laboratory like the NFL as far as teaching how they install plays how they interact with each other man it's not Ohio State it's not Alabama it's the NFL It's the smartest, best football players in the world. Josh Rosen, let me tell you what you don't know. This is the best coaching you'll ever receive in your life. You know the reason why they're in the pros? Because they're the best. That's why they go to pro football. You graduate from being a high school coach, you go to college, and you're in the pros. That's the best of the best. It's the best coaches. It's the best players. And there's nothing wrong with being smart. There's a bunch of smart guys there. But I'm going to tell you what they don't want. They don't want a smart ass or someone thinking that he's smarter than everyone else in the building. Now, the reason why I said he talks too much is because he don't know that much about the NFL. For him to assume that his head coach or his offensive coordinator is not going to want to be there as much as him, that's just really naive for a smart guy. All right? There's only 32 head coaches in the NFL. There's only 32 offensive coordinators. There's only 32 quarterback coaches. All of these guys take these jobs as being very, very important. And when you get a piece of raw clay like Josh Rosen, that's where you're able – the coach gets better. When Josh Rosen walks into that quarterback room, that coach got better. He's already one of the best in the business. So just give him the respect. And early in your career, it's not why. It's do what I told you to do. And then once you become an accomplished player, I don't explain to you the why part. In the NFL, that's the difference in college. Nick Saban, Urban Meyer, they can make you do something. Once you get into the pros, they can tell you to do something, but they can't make you. They explain why I want you to do this, why this works, why the tight end is flexed out like that, why we have the protection on the backside. So we want smart people, all right? You're two days before the draft. Get out of it. Just like we had Sam Darnold. He sat right here, didn't say nothing. You're not supposed to say anything in these times, Nick. I don't care how smart you are. Like, because all you can do is hurt your position for the draft. Realize, it's going to change after Thursday night. Then he can go on to talk and do in his regular way. It's understanding where you are. And part of this draft process, he's better off saying less than saying more. And I don't mark him down because of anything he said, because I know better. I know that he doesn't know. And when you look at the relationship with a, with a quarterback and his head coach, 
or the quarterback and the offensive coordinator, it's it's a collaborative process. So you go through the game plan, even when you install on Wednesday, and you want the quarterback's feedback. That's important. What is he comfortable with? What does he like? When you get to Friday, you have him identify the plays that he likes the most. Because as a play caller or head coach, you want that player to be comfortable, and you want him going into the game as confident as he can be. But Chris makes a really good point. There is a difference between being smart and being a smart ass. So when it's when it comes time to move forward, or if you get to a point where you have to agree to disagree, then the players got to defer. And 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 there may be times where the coach defers, but at some point you have to move on. Otherwise, it just becomes disrupted to the game planning process, and and more of a headache than than it's worth. Brian Billick, his call sheet after a time and period, it was like this. He had a highlighted area to the top left, and that was the Chris Carter zone. And the reason why he had that on there, because he got tired of me coming up during the game saying, Coach, what are you going to run for me? Coach, what are you going to play a call for me? But the reason why he put that sheet on there is because I used to go into the office on Tuesday. I used to be in there when they put the game plan in. The thing that Coach Mangini challenged his players to, if you want to be part of what we're doing, come in here when we're putting it in. He didn't do it as a rookie, I'm sure. No, you have to graduate to that. I, I went through many years of doing exactly what the guy taught me to do. Then after that, I was like, hey, Coach, why am I doing this? And then he began to explain to me because that's the way I was taught at Ohio State. To learn football, learn every position, learn the responsibilities. And that's what Earl Bruce, Jim Tressel, Urban Meyer, all those great coaches I played under, that's the way they taught me. I got a lot of respect for Josh. I had a lot of problem with wide receiver coaches and coordinators because I thought what I knew about football, it wasn't always the way that they saw football. But I knew who was my boss. I knew who my superior was. Sure. And I knew that they gained more respect when I watched all the film when I came to the meetings that they were meeting on Tuesday, our off day, then it gave me more input to what I knew football-wise. And that's the way Josh will win over his coaching staff and his teammates. So both of you basically on the same side as far as it's, it's – it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a distracting situation to have someone come in that's always going to sort of question what you want to do or whether you should or not. You say they shouldn't do in the first year. You should be a sponge. Come in and just do what you're supposed to do. You don't think in any way this affects his draft positioning? Well, yeah. Do I think it affects his draft positioning? I think it already has affected his draft positioning because you hear about knocks on, on other quarterbacks and the knocks on Josh is he can be too smart or maybe it's his, his affluent background or or he can be uh, too opinionated. Those things all do come into play because as you want to understand, when I get this guy in the building, what's he going to be like to deal with every single day? Is this going to be a battle to get to the game plan? Is this going to be a battle to get to the plays that we want to call on Sunday? After the game's over, is he going to support what we did or is it going to be a he's throwing the coaches under the bus, my position coach didn't do this? You, you can have that element to it where – it's it's a different set of problems, but it's still a problem, and it still can be hard to overcome. And no matter where he goes, it's not the coaching staff's responsibility to make him the greatest player ever because they can only do so much. You play a huge role in that. When New England drafted Tom Brady, it was their greatest draft pick ever, but it wasn't their responsibility to make him the greatest. It was Tom and New England and the process. Just like they talk about in Philadelphia, Josh needs to realize it's a long process to being a good player in the NFL. And, and as much as, as Tom has done and knows, Tom knows he doesn't know everything. And he has an openness about him, even at this point in his career. And to me, that's what allows him to continue to grow. All right, Coach, stick around. We'll see you a little bit later on in the show. Coming up, back to basketball. How about those New Orleans Pelicans? Could they actually be better without Boogie Cousins? It's next on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First. We're now joined by NBA analyst Chris Broussard. Nice to see you again, Chris. Well, Chris man. Good to see you. Great man. to be you? here as always. Um, let's talk about the Pelicans, shall we? It appears to me this team has three problems on their hands. Chris Broussard, I'm going to tell you what the three problems are. Number one, slow down the Golden State Warriors, winners of two of the last three titles. Number two, what to do about Boogie Cousins, the team's supposed second oh, star? Oh, no. what's number three going to be? Will the stadium ever get a vegan menu? Oh, okay. I, know. Oh, I was going to say because I was like, the first two are the obvious ones. Right? What's the third one going to be? Vegan Jenny menu. Came through. All right, let's get back to Cousins. I feel like you don't want to talk vegan. All right, that's cool. Reports are New, <coughs> New Orleans is currently considering not giving Boogie a max contract this offseason. So, Chris, we talked about this the other day a little bit. Are the Pelicans better off without Boogie Cousins? Are they 
playing well now because of momentum and the excitement and all of it, or is it because this is actually a better team without him in the I lineup? think they're a better team without him, especially in today's NBA. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Their record is better. They're 21-13 and 13 this season without Boogie. 27 and 21 with him. If it, if they had continued to play at that pace and Boogie stayed healthy, they would have missed the playoffs. They would have missed the playoffs. You know, last year they were 7 and 10 with him. And that 27 and 21 record includes winning eight of their last nine mm -hmm. with him. So and before the, that, they were way worse than that. And the 21 and 13 without him doesn't include the playoffs. So now exactly. they're 25 and 13 against a, a very good team, the right. three seed. If the record without him, not even including the four no mm -hmm. sweep in the playoffs, they would have been the third seed. They were on a 50 win pace. So they play at a faster pace when he's not there. Their defense is better when he's not there. I don't think Boogie, as much as his numbers look all gaudy and great. I don't think he plays winning basketball. He takes six three-pointers a game. Why? You're a 35% three-point shooter, and you're taking six three-pointers a game, and you're 6'11", 270, and nobody could stop you on the post? Why are you taking six three-pointers? Klay Thompson takes seven. You taking six. You know, the mm -hmm. ball doesn't move. We don't run as much. You don't pass as much. I know he gets his assists, but I, not to mention the injury. I mean, yeah. you know, the yes, Achilles sir. is arguably the worst injury in basketball. Hard to come back from. I don't know what he's going to be like when he gets back. Now, he's an asset. I get that. I would hate to just let him walk. Well, that's that's the thing. That I, I can make the argument that the... Because the we never saw Boogie with the addition of Miritich. Miritich has been really good. So how much of them being better has been Miritich? How much has been that Anthony Davis played his best stretch of his career? But was he playing his best stretch because Boogie wasn't he there? Was like differently. And it, Anthony Davis at the five. You can also make the argument that if you stagger their minutes properly. Now, it's a tough coaching job for Alvin Gentry because you're going to ask him to play one style with Boogie on the court, one style with Boogie off the court. We've seen some of the better coaches do it, but to where they're playing only like 20 minutes a game together, Th that's Ray Harden what, and Chris Paul. He did stagger their minutes. They, they were playing 26 together. I'm talking, you know what I mean, to where it's even more a greater discrepancy. But even if you buy into the idea, which I might, you know what, they're just, it's not about Miritich. It's not about a, they're just better without him. I think you still have to consider the Blake Griffin option, which is sign him to an extension and play 30 games, see how healthy he looks, see how good they are, and then if, it's, if you feel like you were better without him, you can get something for him. You will be able to, just like Blake, he had just signed five years, $171 million. The Clippers signed him to that. Before the trade deadline, the first year of that extension, they get back Tobias Harris, a good player, and a first-round pick. That's really valuable. Like, so I, whether or not you think the Pelicans are better with him or without him, I still think you have to try to re-sign him. Because At he's max not, money? Even at max money, I think he's a tradable asset. I think there's enough desperate teams in the NBA that assuming now the, assuming he is not a shell of his former self with the coming back from the Achilles. If he's just 80% of what he was at max money, you can still get a first round pick and expiring contracts for him. Like so I so I think you gotta bring him back in that regard. Yeah, I would be concerned about signing him to a max deal. And, and the reason why is not only the Achilles, but um Demarcus Cousin. His overall attitude around the league, they know about this, yeah. Nick. So how much of an asset he is, like how much he's going to be able to fetch if you bring him back, like that's – I believe that's, that's – a question. That is – that's a huge question. And, you know, what does it limit you from a roster standpoint? Because they need several role players. You talked about them, this being the least depth of any of the playoff teams, especially of the teams that have advanced – I mean, their lineup is thinner. They rely on their starters more than any other team um, in the playoffs. But the sidebar to that is, what does DeBrow think? What does DeBrow think? And want? Rondo, too. Like, because I believe that team. will weigh heavily. You know, do they grant themselves, you know, some cachet with DeBrow because DeBrow wants DeMarcus to come back. And I believe that part to be true. So I believe that... Because of the brow, that's going to pull on him. But I wouldn't sign him to a max deal. And the thing is, if you don't sign him to a max deal, he's not going to be happy. I don't Aww. believe. Well, no, no, that's a problem. That, you, you laughing, but that's a problem. 
I mean, that has been his problem throughout his career is in the locker room, his attitude. I think he's been better. He's definitely been better in New Orleans. This is the most he's comfortable he's been in yet. New Orleans since he left yeah. Kentucky. And if he feels slighted because you didn't give me the max, then he could he could be a problem and, and take the whole thing down. Well, I think the max contract part of this is interesting because when we talk about how he's viewed throughout the league and what the perception is and the optimism, how much of an asset would he be, we're going to get a window into that when we see – who else offers him a max deal? Who else? This I think Dallas will. Okay, so so I don't know the Lakers. So that's I wouldn't, but that's they kind might. of. I think multiple teams will offer him a max deal, which to me speaks to the fact that if you bring him back again, assuming he doesn't look like a shell of himself, assuming the health is decent, those teams will still be in the market for him at the deadline. Not if you give him a max deal, and and his Achilles is not a yeah. no, not a shell of himself, just less. He has less um, quickness. He has less lift in the paint. Like, it's just less. So then that asset, now you become stuck with them. When has he ever shown he can lift a team? Well, I, let me ask you this. The teams he had in Sacramento, could anyone have lifted them? Yeah. You really, aside Gr from, Greater players could have lifted them. I think two guys in the league could have gotten those Sacramento teams to the playoffs. They could have made them decent. I mean, they were horrible. They, they, now, that, that's fair, but, like, he, they, I don't, that team around him in Sacramento and that management in Sacramento was disastrous. He was in a bad I, situation. I'll give you that. I, I thought what, what I think is ideal, Zach Lowe, great mm -hmm. NBA writer for ESPN.com, he made a great – he said, send him to Washington – uh, or he proposed this for Marcin Gortat, Kelly Oubre, and Otto Porter. Well, if the Washington I think would do that, because yeah. he's good, with, good friends with John Wall. Washington, mm. if they lose mm -hmm. this round or even the next round, they got to they got to do something. Yes, I would give it a try if I'm Washington. And then if you're New Orleans, I, you have. You have you got shooting. Well, you, got you have wings. more depth because yep. that's the other thing about just letting him walk that the audience should know. Because New Orleans has not done a great job with their cap situation. Even letting Boogie yeah. walk doesn't open up a ton of cap space. You have the mid-level exception, and that's about it. But it does put you in the luxury tax, uh, right? Well, it, it makes you avoid the luxury tax. But the idea that okay, if we this thirty million we're going to give Boogie, if we don't give it to him, we can sign thirty million dollars worth of players. They can't do it. So if they're going to get good players, it, a deeper roster, even without Boogie, it would almost have to be a sign and trade or a trade because right now they are locked in through 2020 essentially to the team they have all right Chris stick around we'll see you a little later in the show coming up why haven't the Cleveland Browns made up their mind about who they're taking at number one next on first things first I'm Jenna Wolf and thank you for listening to the first things first podcast make sure to subscribe and tell your friends family and co-workers about the podcast which by the way is available on iTunes and all your favorite podcast apps. You can catch a fresh new episode every Monday through Friday on FS1 starting at 6.30 a.m. Eastern, 3.30 a.m. Pacific. So long, everyone.